Well, it's the battle of the feminists, ladies and gentlemen. On one side, we've got British journalist Julie Birchall, who describes herself as a militant feminist. On the other side, we've got the Prophet Muhammad, who was possibly the greatest feminist of all time, according to certain Dawagandists, who will say just about anything to convince Westerners to convert to Islam. The BBC reports, The publisher of a book about cancel culture by Julie Birchall has canceled it after the writer was accused of Islamophobia on Twitter. The book, Welcome to the Woke Trials, had been due to be published by Little Brown in April. But Birchall got embroiled with a row with fellow writer Ash Sarkar. Little Brown said her comments were not defensible from a moral or intellectual standpoint and crossed a line with regard to race and religion. A statement from the company said, We will no longer be publishing Julie Birchall's book. This is not a decision we have taken lightly. Notice the charges here. Islamophobia, indefensible comments, and crossing a line with regard to race and religion. We believe passionately in freedom of speech at Little Brown, and we have always published authors with controversial or challenging perspectives, and we will continue to do so. While there is no legal definition of hate speech in the UK, we believe that Julie's comments on Islam are not defensible from a moral or intellectual standpoint, that they crossed a line with regard to race and religion, and that her book has now become inextricably linked with those views. So, they don't call Julie Birchall's comments hate speech because there's no legal definition of hate speech in the UK, but the comments definitely crossed a line. Writing on Facebook, Birchall said the publishers had told her there was also a concern that the line might be crossed again during the promotion of the book, to which she added, I'll say. Sarkar accused Birchall of Islamophobia after the Sunday Telegraph columnist made comments about the age of one of the Prophet Muhammad's wives. So here's what happened. Eight years ago, a journalist named Rod Little jokingly said that the reason he never became a teacher was that he wouldn't have been able to avoid having sex with students. Eight years later, super-woke Muslim journalist Ash Sarkar used that statement to attack Little for joking about being a pedophile. Militant feminist journalist Julie Birchall replied by asking super-woke Muslim journalist Ash Sarkar about Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. In her harshest tweet, militant feminist Julie Birchall said, But Ash, I don't worship a pedophile. If Aisha was nine, you do. Lecturer, lecture thyself. Naturally, super-woke Muslim journalist Ash Sarkar claimed that calling Muhammad a pedophile was both racist and Islamophobic. Militant feminist journalist Julie Birchall's publisher agreed, and her book on cancel culture was, well, canceled for calling Muhammad a pedophile. Now, why would someone call Muhammad a pedophile? The main reason is that he was a pedophile. Muhammad had sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl named Aisha. This is all over Islam's most trusted sources. We'll just read one passage. Sahih al-Bukhari 5133. Notice the chapter heading. Giving one's young children, not adults, giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. Why? By virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, no monthly period, i.e. they are still immature. That's Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran. So, why is it okay to let someone marry your young daughter? Because the Quran talks about marrying girls who are too young to have a monthly period. And the idda, the idda is the waiting period to divorce your wife if you've already had sex with her. And the idda for the girl before puberty is three months in the above verse of the Quran. So, 
The Quran is laying down rules for divorcing prepubescent girls after having sex with them. And now, to illustrate the Quran's claim that marrying and having sex with a prepubescent girl is perfectly acceptable, Bukhari presents this hadith. Narrated Aisha that the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. There are, of course, some other reasons someone might call Muhammad a pedophile. He used to suck on the tongues of little boys, and he once proposed marriage to a baby. But let's stick with his marriage to a prepubescent girl. Should you call Muhammad a pedophile simply because he was a pedophile? I would say that's entirely up to you. If you don't want to offend Muslims, you don't have to offend Muslims. You can be polite and not tell them that their fake prophet was a pedophile. But if you're bothered by the fact that a man who's been put forward as a beautiful pattern of conduct by the Quran climbed on top of a prepubescent nine-year-old girl and put his 53-year-old penis inside her, and you want to call him a pedophile? That's also up to you. Should someone be canceled and be forever labeled a racist and an Islamophobe for calling Muhammad a pedophile? That's just silly and idiotic. Does Muhammad get a free pass on immoral behavior simply because lots of people love him? Imagine this scenario. Suppose Donald Trump next week gets caught secretly marrying a nine-year-old girl. Suppose his fans declare that anyone who criticizes him for it is a racist, and that anyone who calls him a pedophile will lose their jobs. Anyone can understand how absolutely insane that would be. But somehow, we're supposed to mindlessly accept the idea that the only possible reason for calling Muhammad a pedophile is racism. By the way, what race are people attacking when they call Muhammad a pedophile? His companions testified that he was white, with an elegant face. They referred to him as this white man and drew attention to his white complexion. They wanted us to know about the whiteness of his shins and the whiteness of his thigh and the whiteness of his leg and the whiteness of his stomach and the whiteness of his forearms and the whiteness of his cheeks and the whiteness of his armpits. Muhammad was whiter than an albino in a snowstorm. Should we therefore conclude that anyone who has a problem with a 53-year-old man spreading the legs of a prepubescent nine-year-old girl must hate white people? Why was race even brought into this? Easy. It's a simple way to manipulate morons. Does someone like super-woke Muslim journalist Ash Sarkar really want to explain why she believes it was perfectly acceptable for her prophet to have sex with a little girl? No. But how can she avoid it since she's the one who brought up pedophilia and she's been called out for hypocrisy? No problem. She can just start whining about Islamophobia and racism and she knows that the world will rush to defend her and her prophet. There's one thing I want to point out in all of this. Think about how many different people and groups from completely different backgrounds have the exact same agenda here. The Charlie Hebdo massacre and all the related attacks, what was the goal? The goal was to control what people can say about Muhammad. A Twitter mob gets a woman's book canceled for calling Muhammad a pedophile. What's the goal? The goal is controlling what people can say about Muhammad. On October 31st, I posted a video titled, Islam's Free Speech Hypocrisy. Muslim leaders from around the world were claiming that any speech that offends Muslims should be banned. I replied that there's offensive speech in the Quran, and that if governments are going to ban offensive speech, they would need to ban the Quran as well. I pointed out that it's simply hypocritical to say, ban speech that offends me, but if my speech offends you, too bad. YouTube blocked my video and gave me a strike for hate speech. 
the YouTube trust and safety team declared that it's hate speech to point out this hypocrisy. That's very similar to what just happened to Julie Burchill. A Muslim woman was complaining about a man's comment about sex with students. Burchill pointed out that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Now her book on cancel culture has been canceled, just as my video on Islam's free speech hypocrisy was banned as hate speech. Islamic terrorists who slaughter people over cartoons, the trust and safety teams of all of the major social media platforms, tons of politicians, tons of journalists, tons of educators, tons of entertainers, they're all on the same side here. They have different methods of reaching their common goal, but their goal is exactly the same. They all agree that critics of Muhammad must be silenced. If you believe that you should criticize Muhammad, or at least that you should be allowed to criticize Muhammad, there is a massive alliance organizing itself against you right now. It's an alliance of tech giants and terrorists, journalists and jihadis, lawmakers and suicide bombers, educators and people who literally behead educators. They all agree that you need to keep your mouth shut about Muhammad unless you're praising him. If I were you, I might be thinking about forming a counter-alliance, an alliance of people who say, whatever else we may disagree on, we all agree that we do not want to have our rights under the control of an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and pedophile. Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, whether you're a feminist or someone who can't stand feminists, introvert or extrovert, left or right, up or down, if you do not want to be forced to obey an illiterate 7th century Arabian caravan robber and pedophile, I'd say it's time to lay aside your differences and announce to the world we are done submitting to the demands of the most obvious false prophet in history. And if it hurts your feelings that we're done submitting to the demands of the most obvious false prophet in history, then prepare to have your feelings hurt. And hurt some more. And hurt again. Until you stop trying to control us.